Hello everyone, this is the seventh lesson of the Rust Crash Course and today we're going to talk about ownership, which is a core concept in Rust and if you get this then you can start writing some serious Rust code. So this lesson will be divided into multiple parts because it is not super trivial and will be a bit of theory but I think it's necessary to really grasp those concepts well. So without further ado, let's get started. All programs have to manage memory in some ways, and there are various types of memory management techniques. In languages like C, low-level languages, you usually have to manage memory by yourself. You have to explicitly call malloc or free to allocate or release some memory. Of course, this was a great source of bugs and it wasn't super convenient for programmers and so garbage collectors were introduced, such as in JavaScript, Python, Java. There you have this garbage collector that handles the memory management for you. But this comes at a price, speed, because those garbage collected languages are always slower than the low level counterparts. And so Rust here proposes uh, a intermediate approach in which uh, we get the incredible speeds that are achieved with low level languages such as C, but with a system that uh, ensures that things are done correctly. We say that this is a safe language and uh, we see this uh, ownership system in Rust, of course, but also in modern C++, of course, not in the same extent, but uh, we get this uh, safety with performance at the same time. So before diving into the actual Rust ownership system, I wanted to make a quick recap of the difference between a stack and a heap. In most languages such as Java, JavaScript, Python, you don't have to worry about this thing, but in Rust you have to do so. A stack is basically a data structure or a part of memory that takes a given entry and puts it at the top of the stack, okay? And the core idea is that we always put things one over another. When we want to extract one thing from the stack, we always take it from the top. So this kind of a structure has the so-called LIFO semantics, so last in, first out. And all the entries that we put on the stack have to have a fixed size. We cannot put variable size in the stack. On the other hand, if we want to put objects that don't have a fixed size, we have to use the heap. And when we want to allocate an object on the heap, we ask the operating system for a given memory amount, and this operating system finds a free spot in the heap, allocates it, so marks it as occupied, and returns a pointer to this memory location. So the heap is less organized, it is slower than the stack, but many times it is the only way to deal with those dynamic uh, structures. All right, so we are now ready to talk about the actual ownership rules, and there are three of them. The first one states that each value has a variable that's called the owner of the value. There can only be one owner at a time, and when the owner goes out of scope, the value is dropped. So, to make things more clear, let's see an example. We have here a variable i with value 50. Now, this variable is valid until it goes out of scope. But what is a scope? A scope is a part of the program in which the variable is valid. If, for example, now we print this i, as we've seen in the previous videos, you will see 50 appear, okay? But if I now introduce uh, brackets and put the variable inside the brackets, what happens is that the program do not compile because i is not found in the scope. As you can see, i goes out of scope here because uh, these brackets define a scope, this block define a scope, and uh, here the value is basically dropped, so we cannot use it anymore. We'll see now some more complex data types that actually require this dropping mechanism to work correctly, but the thing to keep in mind is that once this variable i reach this point, it's dropped, like uh, calling a free in the C language, for example. Right, so to make things clearer, I'm going to talk about the string type, and I'm going to cover it in much more detail in one of the future videos, but for now, 
let's follow along. So one of the interesting thing about the string type compared to the basic types we talked about in previous videos is that it is allocated on the heap because we don't know in advance what its size will be. So to declare a string, what we do is thing let s, the variable name, equals to string from and then a literal, which is uh, the initial value, for example, a, b, c. This is only one of the ways you can create a string, but I'm going to cover them in the next video. What is important to say is that the string, as I said, is allocated on the heap. So due to the ownership rules of Rust, we said that a variable, when it goes out of scope, it is dropped, which means that if it uses some memory in the heap, that memory is released, which means that compared, for example, to a language like C, we don't have to say free S after using it, but just by going out of scope, the memory is released. And uh, for example, if we print again this string, which is uh, the same syntax as with the integer, we will see ABC printing, okay? And as we did in the previous example, if I now include, now place this string right here in another scope, this program won't compile because variable S is not in the scope of the print, okay? And the interesting thing is that when we reach the end of these brackets, this string is uh, dropped and the memory is released. And it may seem easy at first, if you come from languages such as Python or Java, in which you can write like S equal to ABC, and then you can stop worrying about it because the garbage collector, when you're done using it, just uh, release that memory for you. Here in Rust, it's not like that. And uh, this becomes uh, a bit complex when you want uh, to have multiple variables that point to the same object in the heap, which is very, very common in uh, normal programs. All right, so let's see an example. We have two variables, for example. We can have variable x equal to 5 and then variable y equal to x. If we now try to print uh, y like this, what you may expect is that the value of variable x, which is 5, is copied into variable y. And if we try to compile it, indeed, it prints 5. This is true for basic data types, such as integers. When we assign a variable of this basic data type to another one, it copies the value. But that doesn't happen with the complex types, such as strings. If we now try to say, for example, let s less 1 is equal to string from first, all right? And then s2 equals to s1. We try to print s2. What we have, as you may expect, is that we get first printed. But a very interesting thing that you may not expect is that if we try to print S1, what we get is a compiler error. And it says borrow of moved value S1. So to understand what's happening, let's go back to the whiteboard. All right, so when we create variable S1, what we do is that we ask the operating system to allocate a memory on the heap, all right? And this heap right here, okay, say that we allocate this memory location to store our string. And then we get the pointer, which becomes the value of S1. So S1 is, in fact, a pointer to the heap location. When we create S2 and we assign S1, what happens is that instead of having a copy of the heap memory, which would be very expensive because if the heap object is very large, then copying it would be very expensive. What we do is copying the pointer, all right? Now, in many languages, this would be perfectly fine. So two variables holding a reference to the same memory location on the heap, all right? In Rust, because there could be only one owner at a time, when we assign S1, S2 equals to S1, what happens is that we invalidate the first S1 reference so that now only S2 has a reference to the heap memory and S2 is the new owner of this heap location. 
When S2 goes out of scope, this keep location gets freed, okay? And if we don't do this process, what happens is that when both S1 and S2 goes out of scope, we would free this memory location two times, which is a bug, which is an error. So Rust solves this problem by assigning only one owner at a time, which is the one that when goes out of scope handles the memory release. To conclude this video, I'm going to talk about the first example, the one with integers. So if I put let x equals to 5 and let y equals to x, and I now try to print x, in this case, I won't get any error. It works as expected, even though this seems to be contradictory. I mean, it is the same example with strings, but now it is working. And the thing is, as we said before, the integers are basic types that are put into the stack. And those types implement the so-called copy trait, which means that we can actually copy the value itself and not a reference. And this is only possible for basic types. As soon as a type has to allocate memory in the heap, this process won't work and we'll have to clone the variable in order to use it. All right, so that was all for this video. In the next one, I'm going to talk about ownership and functions. And uh, if you liked the video, please consider subscribing to the channel and uh, leaving a like because it really helps. And I hope to see you in the next video very soon.